So thank you very much for joining uh, us today to a new session of the BBME uh, 600 seminar series. I'm very happy uh, to have today with us uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Tompkins from Laleman and one of his students, uh, uh, Ms. Jenna uh, Buasali. <laughs> Sorry for, for this. So um, Dr. Thomas, um, was research director uh, in the at Laleman Health Solution uh, from 2000 to 2021. He is working in the research at, and development at Laleman for the last 25 years. <laughs> and uh, very recently, he moved on as uh, as the health uh, ingredients research and innovation di direction with Laleman Bio Ingredients. He studied at McMaster University biochemistry and genetic engineering, uh, where he worked on, uh, on uh, carcinogenic properties of, uh, of uh, prozolidone metabolites. And then he moved at University of Toronto to do his graduate studies, again in biochemistry. And he worked on phospholipase C, a signaling pathway in multiple sclerosis. Before joining Lalman, he, he had a uh, answer post industrial postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Guelph, I guess so. Um, and today, we are very pleased to hear his talk about the microbiome uh, as a target for, uh, for um, health, uh, health, mental health, and uh, neurodegeneration. Dr. Thomas? Uh, We don't need this. All right. Uh, well, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, let's get this. People in the front, do you mind if I take my mask off? Okay. okay if, if you have some concerns, <clears throat> I'll just step back or I'll put my mask back on. But I think it, <clears throat> it's nice for you to be able to, to see me and, and to be able to hear my voice, although I've been told that uh, people have no problems hearing me. Um, I often give presentations um, around the world and, and you know, four or 500 people in the room talking on their phones and things like this, and you gotta make yourself loud. So um, just to give about who, again, a little bit who I am, um, a little bit different from what you've heard already. Who is the company, Lalaman Inc? And then we'll get right into the main part of our uh, discussion today, which is probably a long way, or it seems like a long way from where you're at in, in terms of your personal studies, I suspect. So the microbiome is a target for me in mental health and neurodegenerative diseases. And then I'm gonna ask Jenna to present what her experience has been working with us as a, a clinical research intern. <clears throat> um, who am I? I kinda like to define myself as where I've come through from my scientific perspective. Um, I studied at the University of Toronto uh, with, my, with my mentor, uh, Dr. Mario Moscarello, uh, who studied with Charlie Haynes. And Charlie Haynes, you may have heard of the Haynes plot in the Michaelis, you know, you have the Michaelis Menten plot, you have the, the Haynes plot as well as uh, one of the other kinetic and um, enzyme kinetic uh, uh, plots that you can, you can perform. I uh, studied under uh, Blackman <coughs> at Cambridge, and then uh, Blackman also studied with, with Francis Darwin. Um, and that's about as far back as we can trace the direct path of, of scientific thinking, at least, and mentorship. Um, but I'm sure Francis Darwin was probably somewhat um, uh, trained by his father, uh, Charles Darwin. And you can see how far the evolution has gone in terms of um, hair follicles uh, from Charles to myself. So uh, hopefully that the science hasn't fallen too far from the tree. Um, this makes, I'm mixing my parables here. but. Um, so the apple hasn't fallen too far from the tree. I'm hoping that some of what has been parted to, to Francis, to, to Blackman, to Haynes, to Mario, and to myself um, will be part of what my students will also receive as training in, in, in our programs at, at Lalamont. So who is Lalamont? Lalamont is a, actually sort of this unknown entity within Quebec. It's actually a privately owned Quebec company. Who works in this area? Our core activity is development and production and marketing of yeast and bacteria and their derivatives. And people say, ah, oh, you know, how much do we really need this? It's, it's everywhere. Let me tell you, there's not much <clears throat> in our world that's not impacted by fermentation. 
And you know, if you wanted, you could add viruses to this now because viruses are a very, very popular aspect. Um, so in the future, you may see us being you know, virus producers as well. So it's an old company, as I mentioned. Uh, it was um, actually founded here in Montreal at the end of the 19th century by Frederick Schur, uh, a German fellow, who the local people just called him L'Allemand. Yeah, it makes more sense. He was the German. Um, he started actually selling into the baking industry and then <coughs> started yeast production here in Montreal in the 1920s. About 1923 um, was when he, he began. Now uh, it's owned by the Chagnon family. The, the, the Lenamont family sold it to the Chagnon family in 1952. And now we've gone global under the Chagnon family. Um, yeast plants and, and bacteria plants around the world uh, and selling into a multitude of different areas. We're probably the third largest yeast producer globally. And we're probably one of the top two or three bacterial producers globally as well. You will never see our names on anything, typically. Um, we, all, we sell business to business, so they buy our product and we, they relabel it as, as their own, but we sell a lot of the you know, yeast for the, um, all the baking in the local area, um, for the most part, and, and, and well, all around the world. We have production sites uh, for yeast in the, in the east side, in Prefontaine. We have um, production sites in Mirabel for the bacteria, um, and yeah. yeah everywhere. So that being said, um, what do we use it for? Uh, right? We use this for multitude of areas. As I mentioned, there's not much in our life that is not impacted by um, production of, through microorganisms, whether you're drinking your coffee, you're drinking your hot chocolate, uh, you're drinking your wine, you're eating your bread, um, or you are um, you know, driving your vehicle with using ethanol as a, as a part of the as a fuel source then it's all impacted through, uh, through fermentation. And so we sell into all of these areas, um, everything from animal nutrition, they say through all these food uh, and plant care. Plant care is a massive uh, growing sector currently with the green environmental concerns and how to improve yields to make a sustainable society. Um, uh, we also do like uh, my group. So I was, what I'm gonna talk to you today is in this health segment called Health Solutions, which is human-based health, but we have the animal nutrition. We also have this new group, uh, excuse me, an older group called Savories. Savory ingredients, you know, those are the, your potato chips, right? So you have, um, you have uh, your cheese flavor, your beef, and your ba bacon flavor. Often it's not coming from the raw, those ingredients. They're actually derivatives derived from yeast. So the challenge is how to create these, again, in a sustainable way. So could we make an organism that produces these types of flavors? And then the area that I'm working with now, this is health ingredients. And that gets everything from um, you know, all these derivatives. Could be anything from wound healing through to um, gastrointestinal ulcers, uh, 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 treatment. Many, many areas that we can use fermented products to uh, improve the quality of health. So I'm going to talk to you about the microbiome as a target in mental health and neurodegenerative diseases. And I must say, my title is a little bit misleading because I'm not really going to talk about neurodegenerative diseases today. I just, when I got going through it, I just realized, wow, there's way too much information to, to overload you with all of this. I'm going to talk mainly about mental health, in particular, um, major depressive disorder, and how we've been able to uh, work in this area using microbes that we produce to modify and change people's perception or, uh, uh, of, of stress levels and anxiety and depression. So this occurs through what we call the microbiome gut-brain axis, or we used to just call it the brain-gut axis in the past. And this is a bi-directional communication that occurs between uh, your gut and your brain. And people know this intuitively, I think, because they think, okay, I've got, a, I've got a heavy exam coming up, but my, you know, my stomach is full of butterflies and it's, and it's rumbling, right? So this is kind of a, a physical manifestation of the stress. And the same way, the other way around, if you have a, a dysbiosis of the intestinal tract, I can guarantee you, you're gonna have a, a psychological, it's gonna have a psychological impact on your well-being. And we see this time and time again in various um, situations, medical situations where people have survived the initial infection or 
the COVID experience, for example, and they had these long-term psychological outcomes of, of, of having that. So constant chronic fatigue is a, is a good example of how uh, after disruption, especially the, it may not be the initial infection itself, but it can also be the treatment process, which has a, a greater disruption on the microbiome. And this has really taken off in the last, I would say, say decade here, but more like 15, 20 years we've been working in this area. But uh, it's an old, old, old concept. Um, and we can find you know, traces if you look back through the literature and say, well, where does this idea come from? Even back to the 1800s. Um, but Phillips said this quite well in the British Journal of Psychiatry, saying that the, you, know, you could take live microbes and what we now call you know, probiotics and whatnot could help but treat melancholia, which of course was, was considered what we consider depression today. And then Dr. Roselle, who was a Spanish physician who came to Montreal, started the Roselle Institute, which Lalamont purchased in 1998. Um, this is where I sort of got my connection back into the brain gut axis. Um, he described that this, this thing about the you know, intestinal fermentation, uh, this effect of you know, what he called bad, a toxic effect of bad fermentation um, uh, uh, products and how they produce you know, languor, dizziness, headaches, excitability, insomnia, et cetera. And so this gets back to what we can talk about nowadays is metabolomics, right? It's the fermentation process that's creating these compounds which influence how we feel or how we, how we um, let's say, interact with our environment, how, how we perceive our environment. Um, now, maybe not everything he said was right, because he only had the whiff test, right? He could only take the, the, the fecal samples and smell it and say, oh, there's butyrate there, there's acetate there. Um, he had the best analytical system going at that time, which is his nose. Um, but there, now we have all sorts of analytical opportunities. We have all sorts of um, means of measuring the bacteria using you know, shotgun sequencing and 16S sequencing. So we get a much better profile and we, we can actually begin to map these pathways. And so that's what we're working on currently in the Lalamon Health Solutions. So I'm going to talk to you about this product that we developed in uh, around 2002, 2003. Um, it's a combination of two bacteria, Lactobacillus helveticus and a Bifidobacterium longum. Now, when I first started at the Roselle Institute, uh, when we purchased it from, from Lalamon and I moved over uh, to, to work on this area, um, one of the things that struck me as being quite amazing was that we had all these clinical studies that they had done in the past, in the, in the 1990s, these old studies, and they were saying, wow, um, here's the improvement on the GI symptoms, whatever, that's, that's significant. Um, but anecdotally, people were saying to us that they felt they were sleeping better, they were less aggressive, and they were less anxious when they're taking the probiotic supplement compared to the placebo. And I thought, this is, this is too much of a coincidence. This is happening across the board. Why don't we study this? So Dr. Henri Duron and myself um, sort of designed this product. He went off, he was an animal scientist. He went off to do the human studies. I was more in the physical human area. I went back to do all the animal studies. So you know, don't, don't understand how that got to that point. But I'd end up doing a lot of the animal, animal work to understand the, I was about how does this happen? What is the mechanism? What are we modifying? How can we make this happen? Um, what, you know, to me, it was foreign. I studied multiple sclerosis at SickKids Hospital. And let me tell you, when groups came to us and said, you know, there may be a microbial component to multiple sclerosis, we had the greatest, greatest laugh at their expense. And we said, how much, how much bacteria do you have in your brain? You got none, right? You, you, you guys don't know what you're talking about. So I had to eat crow a lot, um, I must say, in the last few years because now here I am studying this and I do believe there is um, some room for some microbes to influence uh, through metabolic processes. All right, so I'm going to talk about five different studies. Um, the first one, I, our first two you'll see are just sort of in healthy individuals who scored high in a um, questionnaire about their anxiety and stress. So you're like, you and I, well, maybe more you than I, but you guys, uh, when you're going for up for exams and things like this, this is normal everyday stress. And we sort of captured this 
and we looked at uh, whether or not the probiotic would have any impact. So that first study was in France, um, you know, maybe 70 participants I think there were, and we looked at the GI aspect and the emotional psychological outcomes. We found great impact on the GI, you know, clinically significant findings on the GI. So they were people who had the symptoms or who were stressed had symptoms, higher symptoms of nausea and vomiting and bloating and diarrhea and things like this than those that were on, um, you know, the, so the placebo, or the placebo had higher levels than the ones in the probiotic. So we saw uh, an improvement in the GI symptoms. But we sent this off to the, the um, reviewers for the manuscript. They said to us, yeah, but you missed the most important aspect, which is the you know, psychological and emotional, which we didn't see any significance. But they said, but you didn't use validated questionnaires. And we, we, we were neophytes at this. We said, well, what's a validated questionnaire? What do we need to do? And they said, well, there's, these, there's this whole you know, range of questionnaires that are available that we should be using. So you know, we relied on the CRO, the Clinical Research Organization, to put this together to us. And they said, oh, yeah, we've used it before, but not telling us that it wasn't appropriate, uh, it wasn't appropriate questionnaire. So we went back in with this next study with, with uh, Saudi et al., and also in France, and we screened people in for their stress levels based on this questionnaire, and then we followed them with these validated questionnaires, and I'll talk about that. And then the next three studies after talk, I'll talk about that are um, in major depressive disorders and how we failed or succeeded in some of these areas. So. In the Masaudi, um, we got you know, 55 individuals. We screened them in using one of the scales. Um, so we gave them the probiotic for, uh, let me see, um, 30 days, for basically a month. And then we screened them again with the um, hospital anxiety depression scale and for the Hopkins score uh, check, symptom checklist, by the way, and the perceived stress scale. So what were the results of this? Let's just see. So what we saw was, beyond what I expected, truthfully. Uh, if you look at the, this is the Hopkins score checklist, you saw that the global severity index, and I'm only showing you the significant ones from the Hopkins score checklist, there's more than that there, but we saw somatization, which again is this, this um, psychological distress as manifesting itself as physical symptoms. You know, any of those, those butterflies or those you know, agitated movements and things like that that you often see. We saw uh, reduction or improvement in depression, we saw, as we would hope to see, changes in anger and hostility, which is what, you know, this aggression thing that I had obvious, uh, observed anecdotally from these initial studies. And if you looked at the hospital anxiety and depression scale, again, we saw global improvement, improvement in anxiety and improvement in depression. But these, I mean, they're validated questionnaires for these populations, but they're rather subjective, right? So as a person just, saying to them, I say, yeah, I, I feel better today. You know, this is so, so yeah, they want to feel better. Even placebo works, right? We know that. So, but we did have a biomarker here. We actually looked at the stress indicator, um, cortisol. And we did actually see a corresponding improvement in this as well. So we felt more comfortable saying that our results were significant when we have a biomarker to, 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 to show that as well. So um, that, was, that, was a, that was nice. Uh, we published that data, and the references are at the bottom of the, of the presentation. You can go through it if you, if you so desire. Um, they're rather dry. Um, so we were approached, though, because um, Dr. Julia Rutledge, who is a Canadian uh, expat who lives in um, Christchurch, New Zealand, and, and she teaches at the University of Canterbury. She's got a great book out now, by the way, called um, the Better Brain, and it talks about how diet influences um, behavior and, and outcomes. But she came to us because she said, um, yeah, this is about 2014, she said, Christchurch, New Zealand in 2011 had this massive, massive earthquake, and it devastated a lot of people, and a lot of people's lives were changed dramatically, and that even three years after, there were significant levels of depression and anxiety within these people. Um, this, I don't know if you, if you ever heard about that in the news or at the time, but um, one of my 
staff went down there five years afterwards, and they said there was still rubble. There's still parts of the whole city that you couldn't enter because it hadn't been demolished, because the, you know, the insurance payments hadn't come through. So all these factors, it's no wonder that years after, they still have this anxiety and depression. You, know, you don't have a job, you don't have money to pay, you don't have a house. So there's many things that were uh, um, participating, uh, you know, contributing to this. These patients were quite severe, some suicidal. And the other aspect, of course, is um, she told to us this, their treatment refractory. That means that they, they've tried and failed four or five different conventional antidepressants already. And so that makes it a very difficult challenge. They said, I don't know. Here's the probiotic, here's the placebo, give it a try. So this is the study. Uh, she wanted to assess the impact of the probiotics on depression as measured by a variety of questionnaires to try to get a more global view of the depression. So the Montgomery Asperg depression rating scale is one of the big ones. The KIDIS, which is the quick inventory depressive symptomology, that's another big one. And also she, she added in um, sort of secondary to this um, blood sampling to look at some of the chemokines and cytokines uh, that you're probably familiar with. All right. So she gave the probiotic, we gave the same dose as what we had given in the healthy individuals, and we gave placebo, of course, and we studied, this time we went for eight weeks rather than four weeks, because we felt, well, this is a more severe situation, let's, let's go for longer. Um, here's the result, nothing. We didn't see any improvement anywhere in these individuals. I mean, again, uh, it, they all looked the same all across the board. Maybe, you know, something happening here in the DAS, but uh, if you don't catch it with the other ones, you're probably not going to catch it with DAS. So we thought about this, and I will tell you also the, the immune aspect looked a little bit better. Uh, there was some trending for interleukin-1 beta. There was some trending for TNF-alpha, but we weren't powered for that, right? We powered on our initial outcome, which was for these outcomes. But, we, you know, we, we do your closeout uh, of each study, and you go back to the research you and you say, okay, what will we do next time if we're going to do this study? And one of the things she clearly said is, these patients weren't expecting to be improved, right? They have failed four or five conventional medications. They already had the expectation that this was not going to help them, even going into the study. Um, there were suicide attempts. There's at least four suicide attempts that I'm aware of. Um, and that was, I think that was only one individual, maybe two individuals. Um, so you can see how severe this, this situation was. And we were maybe naive in thinking that we could actually even have an impact. But I think she was desperate. She wanted to try anything that she, she could get her hands on. And she does believe that, you know, that, that, you know there is this connection between what, what you eat, what you consume, your microbiome, and, and what, how you, you perceive your surroundings. So that being said, she said, you should try treatment-naive individuals. So about the same time, I got a chance to talk with uh, Roman Milev at Queen's University in Kingston. And um, he, he wanted to do a study. And I can't remember if I approached him or he approached me. But um, he had a student, Carolyn Wallace, uh, who wanted to try a, a study uh, with the probiotics, because they'd also seen our publications. And I said, OK, uh, all right. But we have to go with treatment-naive individuals. And he was all gung-ho for that, so he, he liked that idea. We would go with treatment-naive uh, uh, participants. Trouble is, when you go with treatment-naive participants, you've got to get past the ethics board, and you've got to have something for those patients, right? So they said, you can do the study. It has to be open-label. OK, so that's fine. We'll just, we'll just run the probiotic and nothing else, and we'll compare baseline to um, after in intervention. Uh, but that you know can be biased because, because you're getting something right, so yeah, it's not the best way to do it. And the other difficulty is, which you didn't realize at the time, but when we were recruiting, so I'll tell you this story short: we got ten individuals who were treatment naive. You know, Kingston's not a big area anyway, right? So you know, you know, Kingston is a pretty rural area. You don't even admit to being depressed in that countryside. I, I can tell you because I come from that neck of the woods. Um, but we got ten individuals uh, that we could we could recruit. And again, most of the time is when you go to your family physicians, a lot of family physicians will say, oh, here's some Valium, or here's whatever else to help you with your anxiety. Um, they don't, and so by the time someone, a specialist like Dr. Milev sees them, they've already had chances to try some of the existing medications. So that being said, Carolyn was, worked hard. She got um, 10 participants. 
uh, three male, uh, seven female, uh, probably from the university you know, campus, I'm sure. <laughs> They're all graduate students, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> But we had, uh, we saw, again, we saw these in, the, in these, uh, we used basically the same scales uh, that we used before. And we saw, actually by four weeks, we began to see, so 30 days, like we saw, we used the same dose as in the healthy individuals and the same dose of what we saw in New Zealand. By 30 days, four weeks, we actually saw a significant difference that sort of then sort of plateaued and maintained itself out over eight weeks. Uh, and if we looked at the um, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, that actually took a little bit longer. So uh, first you seem to get the improvement in the symptoms, and then you, uh, uh, so the self-reported symptoms, uh, I will admit, and then by eight weeks you begin to see uh, improvements in other areas of your life. So that was quite interesting to us. Immune parameters, no change, but we didn't see any big increase or changes in their, they were, you know, had very normal immune profiles in it anyway. But when we looked at the microbiome, we began to see some interesting aspects. Um, so this is, uh, so each, each line, each one represents, or each three, I should say, represents, represents one individual over three different um, periods. So this is three different uh, baseline analyses. So that's, you know, this is one person, this is another person. But what we saw very striking in these individuals, and this is, this is um, 16S at the uh, genus level, that we saw that in, in the females, but not the males, there was this elevated bacteroides. Now you do see some uh, in, in, some of the, in some of the men, um, but predominantly in these, in these women, you saw high levels of bacteroides. And in the men, you saw much less, but you saw this massive amount of prevotellas, which you don't see at all in the women. So there is already some indication that, that maybe there is some dysbiosis going on here. Um, the difficulty is, when you go back to the literature, and I'm gonna show you a little later on, a lot of this has been confounded by um, treatments. So by the time you, somebody reaches to a point where you're actually you know, in a study and managing their um, you know, you're looking at their microbiome and things like that, they've maybe already been on a drug. And so you're gonna miss this, this sort of novel aspect. We went, we were going to go on to repeat this, but then something called COVID happened and we weren't quite able to, to achieve what we wanted to go, go with next. However, that was just a little teaser because I'm gonna come back to that sort of stuff later on. So then at the same time, well, slightly after um, uh, Carolyn started her studies, I got a call from uh, Asma Kazemi, uh, who is a student in um, Tehran, Iran. And um, Asma asked if she could use the probiotic and, and if you want to compare it to a prebiotic uh, and compare that to placebo, so a, a placebo, so a, a, like a three-arm study. And she works with Dr. Jafarian, who is an excellent, excellent um, uh, psychiatrist uh, in, in Tehran. I have great respect for the, for the whole team there, actually. Um, and we wanted to do the microbiome as that as well, but you know, getting samples out of Tehran right now under the current political environment uh, turned out to be impossible, which is unfortunate because I think they did some great work. That being said, so we went in with the, they wanted to do a prebiotic, so we suggested GOS, a galactooligosaccharides, just because we had more data that that would probably be more effective. Um, and then we did the cerebiome, but I said, we'll only go with the probiotic in this group if we can go with a higher dose, um, which didn't make my marketing team happy because they want to sell the lower doses because it's a very expensive product. And, and so it, there's always this push and pull between what you can sell and what you really may need to do to achieve an outcome. Um, so we uh, also, they, these were given concurrently with a variety of antidepressants, serotonin, um, fluoroxetin, uh, and so, uh, we did, you know, primary come was the questionnaire, the uh, dep Beck's depression inventory, and then we also looked at some, some other areas um, because we began to understand that maybe some of this was modulated through metabolic processes around tryptophan. So we looked into to these areas. And lo and behold, when we do this, we saw some very nice uh, outcomes. If you, you know, everybody sort of, sort of starts up here in this 
um, moderately levels of, of, of depression. Um, across the board, we see changes, right? We do see that because they're also on the common commitment with uh, uh, regular therapies, they are seeing a decrease to mild depression, but not significant, a drop actually in the placebo and not significant in the, in the um, prebiotic, which kind of surprised me, but I was hoping for better with that. But we did see a significant difference um, between baseline and uh, the probiotic uh, after eight weeks, and also between baseline, uh, excuse me, the, the placebo and the probiotic at eight weeks. So we actually had a fairly significant reduction in the depression score according to the Brex um, index scale. So we were, we were very pleased with this outcome. We looked into this a bit more with our you know, secondary outcomes, and we saw a significant decrease uh, in the ratio of kinurinine to uh, tryptophan, um, which is primarily as a, reduction, as a result of a reduction of kinurinine itself. And kinurinine is a metabolite uh, often coming from some of these microbes that you really, yeah, I, I say, you, you don't necessarily want to see in a, in a healthy microbiome. Um, they're often associated with a lot of the, um, the pathogens, actually. But that being said, um, you know, and it sort of works with the serotonin pathway. So if you're going through the kinurinin pathway, you're not going through the serotonin pathway or, and, and vice versa. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a balancing act. I don't say one is better than another. I think you need both. Um, but we also saw was improved appetite, which is good in depressed individuals, right? They often don't eat what they should be eating. See this time and time again in students. <laughs> um, total energy intake and leptin levels uh, were increased as well. Again, that's that sort of um, creating that uh, that desire to eat and and showing that they have more energy uh, available. And uh, and again, something near and dear to me, of course, was this brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which our animal models had predicted would show an increase. And so, sure enough, what we can see in our animal models is coming uh, through in our clinical indications as well. Uh, we, again, didn't see much happening in the, um, in the immune factors. Again, there doesn't seem to be any great rationale um, for high levels of these uh, TNF-alpha interleukin-1 beta in these patients, but we, we measured it anyway. We didn't really see much. And again, we saw ur urinary cortisol levels changing. So again, we saw this impact on a, a, a myomarker of, of um, uh, of stress. All right, so that was, that was happy. So uh, how can we summarize this? If you go into ind healthy individuals with a, a dose of about 3 billion CFU, so colony forming units, that's how we measure our bacteria per day, we would have an impact on the GI symptoms, but also on some of these uh, anxiety and depressive scales as well. Um, so healthy but stressed. So you know, you and I on any given day pretty much. Um, when we go into more severely depressed situations, chronic situations, or areas where uh, they are treatment resistant, that dose just does not touch them at all. You know? So we, we learn from that. I, I think we would go back and design that study much differently today if we were to rerun that. If we go into treatment naive individuals, difficult to find, but when we do, um, we were able to have a, a, a very significant impact which would divert them from having to go to the, uh, the hospital, to the clinical situation. So it, maybe stop them from going down that road of where they would need major intervention in their lives. And then uh, with this uh, more severe, or moderate uh, situation, we were able to um, go with a higher dose and achieve uh, significant impact. And this is represented also by some of these major pathways that we would expect to see there. And we were planning this great study here in, in Kingston with uh, Carolyn Wallace during her PhD program with uh, Roman Milev to have a, like an intermediate dose and a, a double dosing here. Uh, and uh, it was this really intricately designed study where they would start on one dose and then go to another dose if they didn't improve and, and vice, and, or if they're on placebo, they would go to the lower dose. We had to give that up during the COVID. We got about, I don't know, uh, can you, I don't know if you were around at that point, but we had maybe 20 individuals enrolled and then COVID came and, and pretty much 
and, uh, again, a lot of them were students, they went back home and whatnot, so it was um, not able to follow that up, so we, we had to, uh, Carolyn needed to finish her PhD, so <coughs> she finished up, she's at University of Ottawa now. All right, um, so this is just some of the publications, I won't spend any time on that, because I think we want to get to the microbiome, which I promised in the beginning and really never talked about. So where is the microbiome in all of this? If you look in the literature for examples of major depressive disorder and how uh, groups that have looked at this, <coughs> you'll find out there's not a whole lot. This is um, a recent review article um, from uh, some, some uh, friends in uh, Cork Island from John Cryan's lab and who are also studying this, this area as well. And uh, they just did a review and, and they got very little out of this in, in terms of information. What you can see is um, it's a lot of limitations due to uh, confounded, confounded by medication and treatments, uh, by the diets. You, when you're working in this area, we have to control everything. We're really control freaks. You'll hear from Jenna. Jen and I are control freaks. We, we want to know the whole organism. We, we don't want to know about one part of the, of the you know, immune param, one immune parameter. We're not going to just go in and measure BDNF because we know BDNF works. We want to measure everything that's there and get everything out of it. I'm, I love whole organism uh, investigations. And not only that, but how is the organism interacting with its environment? So we need to be able to understand um, what are the factors that influence uh, potential outcomes, or, or especially when we're looking at the microbiome. So it's not good enough for me just to measure one aspect. In fact, we got hit on that on the paper. Uh, we submitted a very extensive, we had these microarrays that looked at all the genes, human genes, and we looked at, hey, what's up and what's down? And they came back and they said, you're fishing. I went back to them and I said, we're looking for the truth. We're, look, we're not picking what we want to see. And so there was a bit of a bit of an argument. And, uh, but I firmly believe if you look for what you want to see, yeah, you can find it. But you'll always have this belief that that's what's happening. And that's wrong. You need to look at the whole organism. But again, if you're going to do that, think about what is that, what is that person eating? What are they doing in their lives that could, are they, are they active? Are they doing exercises? Are they sleeping? Are they, um, you know, are they excessive drinkers? Are they, what are they doing? You need to know that and record that if you want to have a great study. Anyway, that, all that to say is that they, they see a lot of different things. They see, you know, um, some of the things are going up, these, uh, some are going down, the lactospiraceae, which I think is a good microbe generally, um, is going down, the acylobacter and the L-stippies are going up, that's probably a good thing. So that maybe has something to do with how the treatment is going for these individuals. Unfortunately, they never recorded whether they were male or female, that, that were going up or down. They never recorded, um, <coughs> which, which, you know, they didn't sort of parse it up by diet or um, which medication that they were on and that, that led to this. You really need to break it down into those levels. Um, if you look at uh, this next one, they actually looked at the active major depressive disorder versus those that were successfully treated. And the ones that successfully treated, we saw some very nice changes. We saw impact of, uh, up increase in, in rosberia, bacteroides. Remember, that was the one we saw in the, in the women. Um, so you know, maybe this is, this is something we would like to see necessarily something that's negative. We don't really know. Uh, Phaseolactobacterium, that's something that we're studying right now, actually, um, hoping that we can produce that microbe in the near future because it's such a great uh, organism that we would want to have in our intestinal tract. And this other group saw so increases in agrothelia. Okay, maybe that's not a good thing, um, uh, but uh, decres depres uh, decreased Prevotella. Now, again, that's what we saw in the, in the male population. Okay, albeit a very small cohort, but we need, when you're thinking about these things and you want to design your study, make sure that you've designed it openly enough that you can go back and you can actually begin to, to um, even if it's a secondary outcome, to look at how you can break that down and understand the components of this. Um, by gender, by activities, whatever you need to do. And, and Jenna's gonna give you a bit of her examples. Um, all right. The other thing is too we're missing here, this is what comes out in the feces. But what happens in the small intestine is another thing entirely. So the small intestine is probably where a lot of this action is happening. 
the microbes that you see in the small intestine you really don't reflect what we see in the fecal samples. We're working with a company in, how are we doing for time, are we okay? Okay, we're working with a company in Calgary that actually has developed this capsule that will open and close in the small intestine. Now, you know, you guys are being you know, bioengineering. You know, uh, this may be something, that, a challenge that you could undertake was to be, how do I capture um, the, the materials in the small intestine, get it out of the small intestine again without having, you know, contamination issues because, you know, before they were going in with scopes and things like that and trying to take samples, ah, it doesn't work so well. You get contamination. Uh, or if you, you know, um, this, so this capsule has to open for a given period of time, capture just the material that's there, then close again, sealing it tight enough that it can pass through and we can collect it again. And it also has to be small enough that people can, can take it, right? So we're working on these types of projects with groups to help us better understand where our microbes are find, found and what the outcome is. And I can tell you what we can see is, because people call us ask that, how does your microbe have an impact? You're giving like, what, three billion and you can expect to see an impact. You go into the small intestine, 80% of what we find are our microbes. So there's a dearth of um, other microbes that are there, and they're usually streptococcus and stuff like this. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing like what we see in the, in, the, in the fecal samples, nothing like what we see in the colon either. So in the small intestine where we understand where the, our site of action is, that's where we find our microbe actually makes the majority of the product, or the, of the microbes, pardon me. So, this is sort of the background from where we're coming back, and, so, and it says, to me, it's a mess. If you don't design your study properly, you'll, you'll be able to say all sorts of things. It looks really good on paper, and you'll get, you'll get published in some probably reasonable journals, but it doesn't really tell us anything to help the story. So what I wanted to understand from our perspective is what determines persistence, or what might be influencing persistence. And, my studies aren't perfect either. We, 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 sometimes you have to cut corners based on costs and things like this. So what we decided to do, we, do, we take a washout period and we do, uh, or excuse me, a wash-in period where we would take multiple baseline samples of these individuals. Um, this was uh, an N of 30 I think we had in the study. And then we would also do a whole gut transit uh, evaluation using these radio opaque markers. So it's kind of like the gold standard for looking at whole gut transit. You give people, uh, they consume uh, in a beverage, these label markers, which are kind of different shapes, stars, triangles, whatever, circles. And then you collect the fecal samples and you look, uh, you do radio imaging to see if you can find these samples again. Sometimes they never show up again. Don't know where they go. Um, but for the most part, you can find out what the transit time is. Then we do a, a very quick two-week intervention with the, with the probiotic, and then we look at the washout. Uh, and again, we're taking uh, samples throughout this time, uh, almost daily fecal samples. Nobody's really done that before. They usually take one at the beginning and one at the end, and they do comparison. Oof, yeah, well, I could tell you, have a, have a drink of you know, strong whiskey or whatever like that, and your microbiome is going to change from, from point A to point B you need really to have this continuum of sampling to get a full spectrum of, and understand the, how things change with time and record you know, diet, what have they been eating, what have they been drinking, um, you know, how much did they sleep. So we did this and we found basically three groups, as you would hope. Uh, there's this group here that are sort of what we call fast transitors for these radio opaque markers. Then you have sort of what we call the, the normal group. So the, the fast group are transiting less than 35, 36 hours. The normal group is somewhere between 40 and 55 hours. And then the, the slow group transit much later. It's about 70, 60 to plus, you know, 70 hours uh, or longer, you know, towards 80 hours in some of these individuals. And then we looked at the microbiome associated with each different group. So um, unfortunately, we changed the color scheme here, but this blue color is the fast transitors. The pink in the center is the normal transitors, and the uh, slow transitors are in the green. And you can see that um, for us, and these are just some representative examples. These are not the totality of what we uh, observed, but they're probably the most, I say, important uh, uh, in terms of um, the, 
the uh, scoring. So if we look, a little late. Okay. So okay. So I got to get it. get it. So basically, very quick story. So we do see obviously differences um, within the microbiome, and if we put our probiotics in the background of this, then we can look at um, how these. So here's the true strains that were in the serobiome product, and you can see that um, you know the lactobacilli they tend to be maybe more in the slow group, whereas the the uh, this bifidobacterium longum, but not this other bifidobacterium, seems to reside more in the normal group. And it seems to be persistent in that group. Interesting, within that though, there's even still two groups. There's one group that it doesn't persist in, and one another group where there is higher persistence. So I, again, we said, okay, let's look what's in those group, those ones. And so we can sort of bring this out into non-persisters and persistent groups, and find out which microbes are more present in each group. So in the non-persisters, where the people didn't retain the microbe, we found bifidobacteria. They already had bifidobacterium. If you didn't have bifidobacterium, you're more likely to retain it. Then same with uh, the coprococcus and the, some of these other uh, microbes that I'm not even going to try to pronounce today because it'll never get out of my mouth. Um, these other ones, uh, if you were persisters, then you had higher blotia, you had higher rosburia, again, which are sort of the nice ones that are producing these um, small short chain fatty acids that we tend to think of being beneficial. Uh, but we also see bacteroides and agrotheria. You say, is agrotheria good or bad? Well, it depends on how the day and how much you have, perhaps. But we're, uh, we're very interested in following up in this area and to seeing how um, uh, these microbes may influence the persistence of our other probiotic microbes and how that might actually influence transit, which then, how does transit influence your behavior? So um, that's a long way away. I'm gonna skip the mechanisms actually because I want Jenna to present her story and her experience with us at uh, Lettleman Health Solutions. So thank you very much. And we'll, afterwards, we'll get to the questions. So let's go on to Jenna. Here we are. Thank you, thank you very much for, for, for having me here. Um, my name is, is uh, Jenna. I am a, a, a clinical research intern at, at uh, Lalma Health, Health uh, Solutions. Um, and I will be speaking just a little bit about the, the uh, student, student experience at, at uh, the company. So a little bit about, about me, I am from, from uh, Montreal. Um, I am currently completing my my undergraduate uh, degree at uh, at C Concordia University in cell and and uh, and molecular biology. Um, I'm I'm in my third third year currently, and I'm also part of the the uh, Concordia Co-op uh, program. So um, as as a, a clinical research intern, I I basically support and and help other clinical research specialists with uh, with the development and and uh, management of all of all of our our clinical trials at the company. So I had applied through through uh, Concordia's co-op uh, program, and and uh, so far I have had a really amazing time. And um, La La is uh, is really a a student stu student friendly company. And there are many, many interns at uh, at uh, the company, and uh, there are many different uh, different opportunities in uh, in the cl cl in the clinical work, preclinical work, and then also lab work. Um, and then we also fund uh, fund my tax projects and and uh, internship grants. So um, because clinical clinical studies, they can take many, many years to go from from start start to end. Um, I have actually gotten to work on many different uh, different studies at at, at 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 many different phases. So I have worked on 10, 10 um, I individual studies, including projects on sleep, uh, pregnancy, menopause, weight, metabolic syndrome, and more. And I have also had the the really amazing opportunity to to uh, fully fully design a brand new upcoming uh, study and to to really create a study study a synopsis and to to also begin protocol 
protocol development and, and uh, contacting potential collaborators. So one, one uh, particular study I have been very, very um, involved in is the, the uh, sleeping, sleeping study. So, so this is a, a relatively recent, um, recent st study. They are, are uh, currently, uh, currently recruiting. Um, and we are, are assessing the effects of a probiotic formulation on, on sleep in, in stressed, healthy adults. So, so sleep, sleep um, issues are really, really common among um, adults, and, uh, and sleep is, uh, is also a key component of, of uh, mental health and is, is really closely, closely related to, to stress. So stress can can actually can actually cause sleep sleep loss by um, by di disrupting natural circadian release cycles of our stress stress uh, hormones, and then uh, causing sleep sleep uh, disruption and then actually perpetuating the stress stress uh, response, and then sleep s sleeping issues are are often um, associated with with uh, with uh, developing mental health health uh, disorders such as depression, anxiety, and um, also issues with with uh, memory, cognition, and uh, attention. So sleep is also closely related to our uh, our microbiome through the brain gut gut uh, axis, um, and uh, sleep 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 loss due to stress can can actually influence our our microbiome composition. Um, causing a, a huge imbalance, which which can then cause um, intestinal permeability and uh, and uh, inf inflammation, which will then act on on uh, relaxation and uh, sleep. So, in in previous clinical trials, we have found that that uh, probiotics actually adhere to the intestinal epithelial cells, which which could potentially reduce in Inflammation and uh, and permeability, and then in addition, different different probiotic species um, also modulate symptoms of uh, of uh, depression, anxiety, stress, and then also improve sleeping sleeping quality. So our our particular study is uh, a collaboration with the Centre de Recherche Cerveau at uh, at Université Laval, and um, I have actually had the opportunity to to go travel to Quebec City and to and to really participate in a site initiation visit. So we had basically opened up the research site for our our uh, trial and uh, we had delivered all all uh, necessary materials, inspected the site and then also trained trained uh, personnel to make sure everything would be 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 uh, be going smoothly. And then we also ver verified that all all uh, documents log and and any other other uh, necessary logistics were all in in place so that they could begin recruiting. So throughout this whole whole uh, internship process, um, I have really learned a lot about differences between academia and the industry, um, and I have found that that uh, academics really focus more on on uh, theory. And really provide us with a good, good uh, foundation to be able to fully understand the in the industry we are are uh, going uh, going into, and it'll it'll also give us tools to be uh, to be resourceful and and it'll act a lot as as a guide. Where uh, whereas in uh, the industry it is extremely fast fast paced and and uh, projects change every single day so we we will really learn a lot more through through um our our day-to-day -day roles and like ac act activities and um there is also a lot more more uh, collaboration between but between different different uh, departments like like uh, marketing sales production um and then we can also really experience firsthand how our our particular products impact people all around the world. So, uh, any final 
final uh, rec recommendation is that teamwork is extremely important. Um, you will often have to be collaborating with, with uh, companies, depart departments, scientists, and uh, communication is really, really important in, in just making sure everything goes, goes well and that the actual project is, uh, is uh, successful. And uh, don't be afraid to like, take risks. Um, really embrace every single opportunity that'll be, be uh, presented to you. Um, whether it be professional or, or uh, academic, you never know what you might, might find and uh, you might end up being very, very passionate about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tompkins, and thank you very much, Jenna, for this nice presentation. We'll have a little bit of time to take some questions. Now. Uh, Sabrina, thank you so much for the talk, both of you did a great job. Um, I was wondering if you compared the microbiome between the people who are naive and who had treatments, and if there's a difference between those people. And that explained why you needed more CFU for it. Yes, and I, again, I, I, we don't have that data. It, it would have been, I guess we're going to take this off a bit. We don't have that data. It would be really nice to have a chance, especially in the study uh, that we, we ran in Iran, because there they had the different drugs we could have began to parse out, and again, you know, we, we have more control about how these studies are done when we look at it. Um, so we don't have that data, long story short, but that would be fantastic. And that's what we had planned to do before COVID as well. So eh, I kind of wrecked it. <laughs> Um, regarding the experiment that you ran on the individuals who were chronically depressed and mm -hmm. resistant to treatment, um, do you think that the probiotic treatment would affect the same mechanism that leads to treatment resistance in these individuals and what that mechanism might be? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a million dollar question for sure. Um, you're, you're at, at some point, um, yeah. Let's put it this way. A lot of the antidepressant micro, my, molecules, as you probably are aware, are actually some of the same molecules that we use at other doses to impact GI function. So a lot of, you know, um, a lot of the TCAs and things like that that are being used are actually started out their lifespan as uh, to help modulate um, motility. So at the base of this, you know, some people have suggested that, you know, intestinal motility might be part of the story and that, you know, are the probiotics impacting motility? Um, or are there other microbes in the, in the gut? And so that kind of brings in what I was showing you towards the end. So there may be some commonalities there. Um, there also could be the potential that some of these drugs uh, were drug, or some of these products were resistant to simply because maybe they are being metabolized at a faster rate by these microbes. And one of the things we're lacking in our, in our psychiatry studies is uh, we're not taking into account things like gut transit time. We're not taking into account diet. We're not taking into account the microbiome. So that's, uh, again, kind of comes back to itself and or motility. I mean, I, I'm, I'm now, if I run a study in, in the future, I'm going to measure the motility. I'm going to maybe say, okay, these are the normal people. Let's see how they work in normal people or normal bulb habit people compared to fast and slow and on the background of the, of the disease itself. And that's, I think, where we're going to begin to, to make some um, real connections once we start personalizing the medications. wonderful presentation and uh, I just had a quick question so I've heard of studies that have looked at the microbiomes of babies delivered through a c-section versus yes. vaginally Correct. and uh, I know that the ones delivered through c-sections uh, often have an insufficient gut microbiome mm -hmm. and I wanted to know if you had any insights on how that can be overcome maybe later in life and if that makes them more predisposed to different mental health uh, conditions. Absolutely, and that's a great way, and, that, and this is way we, where we are going 
with many of our studies. Uh, Jenna mentioned the, the pregnancy study, and this is exactly what <clears throat> we're trying to understand is um, if you give the probiotics to the mom, uh, can you find them in the infant? And on the background of measuring those mothers that get through cesarean versus those that give through natural childbirth. And because I'm strongly of the belief now that there is a direct transfer from mother to infant of microbes that is um, determining later events in their life. Uh, it, you know, we can look at the microbiome and say, okay, by six months, even if they were delivered by cesarean versus natural birth, they kind of look the same. But um, the window for opportunity is probably before that because we see things like necrotizing enteric colitis and things like that. So a lot of these things are probably preset early on in life. Uh, even if you eventually, you know, that microbiome changes, it may be too late by that point. So I do agree that I think we need to capture some of this. And there's other factors that we're interested in right now as well. Lewis B antigens, the bifidobacterium bind to Lewis B antigens. Lewis B antigens are actually predominant in breast milk. And so we believe that uh, if you are a producer of Lewis B antigens, then you're more likely to retain the microbes as well. So it will also de determine uh, which microbiome you have as well. And does that set you up for future long-term outcomes? Probably does, actually. So again, bring into as many factors as you can to understand the organism as a whole, and you will begin to dissect the stories a little bit better. Um, thank you so much for the presentation to you and to Jenna as well. Um, my question was related to, um, you showed the persistence of the microorganisms themselves. I was wondering in the studies where you saw that it had some effect on the, on the symptoms, like mm -hmm. alleviating the depression symptoms, if after ending the probiotic treatment, if you expect that effect to be maintained, or yeah. if you expect it to be lost over time and you need to constantly beyond the probiotic? Right, that's, that's an excellent question. We, we're very new into this area. We do see that there are longer term um, impacts, so that this continues on, in terms of the psychological outcomes, this continues on for, for quite some time, even though those microbes are washed out again fairly quickly. So we do think that, um, you know, there's, there's been a, so there's this long term modification. How long that goes for, we don't really know. Um, we did some work with fecal transfer patients for um, ulcerative colitis, or excuse me, uh, for inflammatory bowel disease, and we saw that the impact was long term, even though the, the micro, microbiome reverted. So, right now, I, I don't have enough data to tell you that answer, unfortunately. But it's a great question. That's, that's exactly where we're going with these, with these types of bringing the pieces together. Hi, um, my name is Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Thank you for the presentation. I'm also doing research on microbiome, so it was very insightful, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. First, did you guys um, measure treatment compliance in any of the studies, and yeah. if it was part of the validated scales or, or whatnot? Yeah. And secondly, um, considering the, the relationship you have with both the industry and academia and science as well. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know um, from your perspective what kind of uh, market gap you see currently in the industry and where do you see it going specifically? Absolutely. Yes, uh, so obviously in, in all the studies that Jenna is talking about, we have to measure very carefully the compliance. Um, let's face it, people are we try not to incentivize them too much to participate by cash and things like this, but you have to give them something. And, you know, but some people will toss them out and, and, and not comply. Um, fortunately, we have an advantage with, with the probiotics is we can go back in with our strain-specific primers and we can detect our microbe so we know if they didn't, if they stopped taking them. And you do see the odd individual that, yeah, one or two days and then, yeah, it's not there. Um, and we say, okay, you know, you go, you can't, unfortunately, you can't go back to them. We just mark them as an outlier because they said, okay, did they, did they take it or not? Um, but we do have ways of being able to measure compliance. But for the most part, though, um, we found very high compliance for the, uh, you know, there can be deviations, like, you know, oh, I, 
I forgot, or I was, I was traveling yesterday and I wasn't able to take my probiotics. Is it okay? Yeah, that's cool. No, no worries about that. Um, but uh, if they you know go away for a week and then they come back onto it, yeah, then that's 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 another situation. So yes, that's um, compliance is absolutely important, but we have ways of checking on that. Fortunately, with the new tools, you know, the sufficient tools. Now, where are we going uh, in terms of uh, of academia and 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 industry? Let me just say, not all companies will probably work like Lalaman. We are science-driven company. We want to know mechanisms of action. We want to understand what that microbe is doing in that particular context. And again, within the whole, you know, if you're studying plant care, we want to look at the soil, we want to look at the plant, we want to look at the other organisms on that plant. We want to know everything about that. Con weather conditions, who knows, for, you know, whatever. Um, water, moisture, whatever. So um, not all companies do that. Some companies use science more as a tool to get, you know, better process development. Some companies, so that, you know, to me, that would be the most boring thing in the world, but there's a lot of people that love process development, and, and that's where they should be, and, and so there's, there's those opportunities. In our group, we tend to let the students operate at a graduate student project level. We try to give them an individual project that they can um, create and develop uh, into something unique, part, a unique part of that story. Um, so I've had um, a previous uh, clinical intern who wrote a meta-analysis uh, with uh, a, a, a systematic review with meta-analysis. She wrote a whole article just uh, and had that published in a, in a, in a very large journal, actually. Um, so this is the sort of thing that you could do. But I know other companies kind of use students like QC lab techs. Which is okay. You need to do that maybe experience as well, but it doesn't give you a full research experience. We want to go for the full research experience. Where is it going? Um, you know, obviously, companies follow trends. Uh, so right now, immunity is a big trend. Um, it's good timing to be in pharmaceuticals <laughs> again. It wasn't five or ten years ago. It was a ter terrible place to be. But today it's back. We got vaccinations programs and um, all sorts of opportunities there. I would say that uh, right now, the, you know, the hot trend is immunity and this gut, or the, the, the microbiome um, and the gut-brain axis and that sort of areas. Those are those are major topics currently. So, I think if if you are open, you can pretty much write your own story. Um, and it doesn't matter how you, uh, what field you're in or how you approach it, if you have an idea and you want to bring that to a company, companies are often, you can usually find a match uh, and the companies are willing to listen. And you know, part of my goal to be here today is actually also to speak with your faculty to create an opportunity for um, collaborative sciences, but also to create opportunities for students to to come into our facility to intern, to learn what we do, and to bring that back to the university. And at the same time, you're bringing the novel ideas, you're bringing the novel, uh, most up-to-date fundamental research into our group. So you know, we've got students from McGill who are teaching us about creating brain organoids. How do, you know, so from Thomas Durkin's group, um, they're teaching us about, about brain organoids. We're teaching them about how microbes interfere interact with those real grenades. So it goes both ways. So there's great opportunities, I think. Do we have more questions? So then, thank you very much again for this great uh, talk, uh, Dr. Tompkins. And thank you, uh, everyone, for participation today. Thank you. We'll see thank you, you next week. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's great thank to see you, you all. Jenna.